Okay? What law does Rosa Waitaka and Jenny Dia Fulanza play for Mr. Tamsevin? When violate human rights here in Uganda, talk of the corruption when Ambassador Jimmy Kolka had placed travel bans on his brother, General Salim Saleh, and his wife, Jovia, it was so easy for Mr. Tamsevin to use Rosa Waitaka and Jenny Dia Fulanza to influence removing of those travel bans on General Salim Saleh and his wife. Then they robbed for him the 2007 deal where Mr. Tamsevin was to provide the United States and the UK plus UN soldiers to go to Somalia. Okay? Talk of Kanani Nathan. Eh, the Agoa, those virgin girls. Kanani Nathan. That Sri Lanka man. Okay? Talk of William Pike. What role was he playing back those days of the protracted gorilla war in Iruwe? And he rewarded him by giving him a job. In a new vision. Okay? So, Mr. Tamsevin understands that, that word foreign agents very well. And they are all they can play in as far as hosting him out of power is concerned. But the people is laboring the foreign agents. You know, Mr. Solomon, we've not been used to opposition key figures who can tackle Mr. Museveni's constituents the way he has been maneuvering within international politics. We've been lacking opposition leaders who can engage Western powers in a way that can infect the gym change. At least we should clap for Bobby Wine for playing very well that, that job. When we were going towards this election, Mr. Seven Rebel Bobby Wine has an agent who is being funded by homosexuals. And when they asked him to explain those countries for funding Bobby Wine as homosexual, he failed to mention one. But all he could say that both these people are being rebelled by what? By homosexuals. So, many governments have enacted laws requiring organizations receiving foreign funding to reject agents. But that is the literate move by autocrats to label whoever is doing his best to awaken. This populace, the garibo sensation in Uganda and society. Eh? That they are agents of for, foreigners. Think of a situation as I conclude, Mr. Solomon. Where we are we are in a, a country that enjoys Museveni's media hegemony. Where the mainstream media, okay, dictates to us what to consume and not what to consume. We beat our way by embracing social media where we can come up and utter whatever we feel like. Then Toko, Agatha, and Mr. Jim Espire comes up with the air going on in the parliament. They expose the rot within the parliament at the annoyance of the speaker and Mr. Seven. We have a saying in Uganda. You mean foreigners are the one feeding these people with information within the parliament? All people within Mr. Seven's government. I rest in my case, Mr. Solomon. Thank you, Mr. Lukwago. Uh, quite a passionate uh, submission there. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Mr. Lukwago, um, thank you. Okay, Muzafa Lusimba, Kabulwa, you have the final say at this. Uh, Solomon, uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity. May I confirm to be heard? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear, sir. Okay, uh, th thank you. Uh, first of all, I I I'll start from what Lukwago kind of mentioned, uh, whether the president indeed knows the magnitude of uh, the word foreign agents or not. And, and, and I would like to say from, from the assertion of, I mean, events that have been coming out, it is, it is quite revealing that indeed, in, indeed he knows it when he says that these are foreign agents. Because I, I, I want you to look at uh, a common Ugandan, someone who is down there and they never acquired a lot in education. When they hear the president on TV saying that those who are fighting, those who are uh, raising up against the government are foreign agents and they are funded because they have their selfish interests. I mean, there are, some, there are, there are many people in the public uh, who always wait for <laughs> Mr. Museveni's statements as though they are buses from a holy book. That whenever he says them, someone will just be like, okay, I think this is true. And at the end of the day, I think, given the magnitude of that statement when he says it and the assertion that they will take it, he, he, he takes us from the, the, the real point of what we should be focused on. And then he, 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 he kind of labels us to be the people who are, uh, I mean, painting the country with a bad image. But I would also want to say, Solomon, that there's a Luganda saying that uh, goes that, there's a phrase that they always say that, uh, that you, you see... You're not sure of which kind of farm grip you can put on a certain uh, root and, and you stay farm. So you will be fumbling, uh, getting uh, farmness from every root you can find. And this is what uh, President Museveni is doing. You see, the truth is, his, his time is out. And you see, when you're aging to the evening, amidst your boring stories to your grandchildren, you start forgetting things. And when you do this, you reach one extent of now requiring helpers. So you dance to their tunes. If you come to the assertion that, indeed, uh, the people you, you, you're dealing with are funded by homosexuals. I mean, let, let us be honest to ourselves. Where does this country get money? Is, is, there, is there any other place that this country gets money that we don't know? Because the countries that give us a foreign aid are countries that support homosexuality. 
I mean, now if we start saying that these countries support uh, the activism that is done by people and more or less the activities of political parties, does it then come back and, I mean, does it then come back and, and brings the assertion still that, uh, that, that, that indeed we are either all funded by homosexuals or we are all homosexuals? I think th th this is something we also have to look at, that if we get the funds from a certain country that's supposed to hom homosexuality, do we become homosexuals in the long run? But then, Solomon, as, as, as I, I, I conclude, I'll say that indeed, that is what he has always been doing. When you have nothing to say and your time is out, you start getting for other reasons to say. But what pains me most is he, 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 he does this, he intends to say what he says. Because I don't think he misses a point when he mistakes the massive frustration with funded energy. Because people are frustrated, they just don't come up and say, okay, I need 5K to come up and start saying that indeed this government is corrupt. I, I don't think I need that. When I have that on my phone and I feel I should express myself, it doesn't require anyone to give me any single amount of money. So I think he intends it when he says when he says what he says, but in the, in, in the same manner, he then misses a point of mistaking our frustration as Ugandans with funded energy. That's All right, thanks a lot. Solomon. What a way to conclude that. Wow. So even when you're speaking with <laughs> like this, you are a funded person. Uh, and, I, and, and, and that's interesting. I can see so many requests. I don't know what I'm going to do because also time is running out because I need to give my panelists an opportunity to ask some questions that have been raised. Ezra. Ezra, Ambassador, you're very welcome, but take two minutes and then I can bring in Gideon. Ezra, are you there? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Solomon. Uh, good evening, sir, you're welcome. Yes, we can hear uh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as uh, you told me to use two minutes, uh, I would like to state it clearly that uh, the president of this country, His Excellency Welcome Dam 7, is one of the most imperious people we have in Africa. Note, President Yuan Museven in 1986, when he captured power, after one year, Obote had left a debt of about 2 billion US dollars. President Museven came and asked, what was this man using this money for? Uganda's public debt now has risen to unprecedented levels, reaching to 25.3 billion, USD. That is 96.1 trillion. Each of the 45 million Ugandans is now indebted to, 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 to uh, 2.5 million Uganda shillings. That shows that apparently President Museven no longer has anything to criticize about any government. First, and then the second, President Museven, when he was in the bush, when he was in, in the bush, he was a rebel at that time. He was receiving, he was receiving support from the one that he calls foreign agents or these agents all these all these manpowers the, the country the countries are like uh, yeah, like england uh, like uh, british like uh, usa and then uh, uh, at the same time his family was staying in sweden all that one it is it is it is it is it is recorded and now he comes and look at people who are advocating for human rights for the livelihoods of uganda to survive and live and he calls them foreign agents i would like to state it categorically that in my understanding, there is nothing, there is nothing the government of President Museveni has ever done for itself, starting from the constitution of 1995. All right, as That's you, you summarize, Ezra. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's why we always say that we have the best constitution, but the execution is wrong. Why? Because we went and copied everything from other countries or from the developed countries. Now it has come to a time where the country has totally failed. That shows that President Museveni, from the start, he was a foreign agent. He did not look at his, he thought that Ugandan would remain the way they are, they would not understand the chapter 4 of the Constitution or the Constitution, what it means. That shows that he was a foreign agent from the start. The president is the main foreign agent, much as he criticizes the people that come out and say his wrongdoings of his state. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. Interesting. Thanks a lot, Mr. Ezra. Uh, Ambassador, thank you. Um, Mr. Wamala, two minutes. Give you two minutes and I can come back to you, so I inspire. Mr. Wamala, you're welcome. Yes, yes, please. Thank you so much. I uh, hope I'm very audible because I'm calling from up country, this side of Luelo. Uh, am I audible now? You, okay. Apparently, I'm very frustrated about the narrative of agents. This thing is totally killing the local uh, environment down here where I reside. People are seriously unaware of what is happening because out of my entire residence, it's very hard to get people have access to news. They always have a small radios and others are not, don't have access to television and they don't have uh, access to such international platforms. The fact is, there's a certain clique within the system that is here to promote this narrative. People are only depending on what comes through those they term as elites. Now, there's so elites within the system come down here and sit on our people's brains. Now, there is a slogan within the villages 
educating our people as some people within the opposition the agents that they are coming here to teach our children homosexuality older men older women are bitter with some of us they say you people move to kampala all the time you have a tendency of promoting bad things you have a tendency of doing this we are schools in kampala children are doing this you can find a common man down here with enough money to take his or her own children within Kampala schools. But the narrative within his mind that schools, they are promoting homosexuality. He finds himself refusing to take kids for a better education system, no matter how much he earns from his own entire system of farming. And this comes to my mind that this thing started all the way from the bush wars. There's this narrative of labeling a certain clique of tribes that this, this, and this. There's one day one of our presidents said, Fenga Baganda. That narrative on international TV, on the national TV, that blackmailing, it is a narrative they always carry around with them. The way they brainwash our people down here is serious. Although you people have access here, you can talk here, but you need to take an extra hand and find out what do the local population find to understand. I traveled to Bonibujo, whereby I found the entire village system of about 200 acres, no one could own a TV. They were all out in blackness. The only way to hear what comes from their people went to Kampala. They asked, what have you seen in Kampala? What is in Kampala? There are people, but they are very aware that some clique is promoting homosexuality. Who took it there? That means these things are sponsored. Someone is sponsoring some news to travel where people don't have access to real news. Or where people will not be able to assert what is true and wrong. I therefore will call upon those who have access and who can reach out to our people. Please, the entire population is dying out. These people are totally smart with what they are doing, apparently. They are trying to sabotage and they are going to cause a serious problem within a certain section of our population. Whereby people will never believe in you, Solomon. Once you come down here and they already labeled you homosexual, you will call upon people because, ah, that man we hear, they said. We hear, they said. Because they don't have the other version of you. We are limited within Kampala streets. We are limited within Mukono. But take a few meters, 60 kilometers away from Kampala. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. People are very aware it is the opposition killing the market for their products. It is them that are killing the market in Europe. People are told that things are rotting in the villages because someone is talking bad about them within Europe. But it's the system taxing them so hard. It's the system importing things that are not valid for their gardens, rather farms. Now, this narrative is so wide, so broad and wide. That's why I dearly request those who can at least enable movement of information far beyond themselves. Please do it. In my place, if I don't buy news, my neighbor will never know what happened, what transpired in Monitor, what transpired in Bukede. They've never understood that news is produced today. They don't even don't follow up what is on television. They only follow up a few radio stations that don't speak sense. I will not note here because it will be fraudulent for me to do so. But there are some radio stations that here promote stupidity instead of promoting the exact information that people should get to hear. You understand. But that's the way system has totally damaged the entire population. A kid grows within the village system to a certain age group is only eyeing to go to Kampala. But is being prohibited to go because the parents say, you'll go there and come back here as an homosexual. And kids tell our own children who always move in and out that don't go to those children. Those children are agents. Those children are doing this. Those kids are bad mannered. Someone gets your kid with a smartphone. He says, the kid is spoiled. Such a narrative within people. Now, we need to fight hard and make sure our own people down here get to understand that the country is developing. Some things have to be put into hand and into place. You have your own understanding, not to listen to someone. You get me right. That would be my submission in case of time, but next time better. Thank you so much. Putting local context to this issue, at least we have spaces, we're on the internet, and we can co have conversations and this about people who are down there. Mr. Wamala, you brought a very interesting point. Thanks a lot. Gideon, two minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Solomon, uh, the other panelists and uh, the listeners on this space. I hope I am audible. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, they the topic of uh, the foreign agent narrative, um, I, I wouldn't want to agree with all of us to completely throw it uh, in the dustbin as if uh, it, it has never existed. It has existed uh, for so long, uh, uh, dating it back to the days of slave trade. Uh, we used to have Africans um, who would aid slave traders and uh, they would be treated well and nicely. Uh, and would help uh, the traders to, you know, to first of all identify Africans, uh, you know, help the entire process of slave trade. So those, uh, if I'm not wrong, would be considered foreign agents. Uh, during the times of colonization, um, while African freedom fighters were fighting uh, to liberate Africa and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, fight for its independence, we had Africans who were in bed with colonialists and uh, would aid them. Uh, so the agents have been here. President Seven himself is uh, was helped by uh, some foreign agents, and and uh, I want to make it clear that uh, um, the, the foreign agent narrative is not limited to the Western world. Uh, someone could be an agent of Rwanda, of uh, Kenya, of Tanzania, for as long as it is another country and uh, it, it it is pushing an agenda in a different country. 
um, you remember that uh, President Seven was also somehow aided by Tanzania. Uh, uh, while, well, he was a foreign a agent then. Uh, so let's not completely throw it away. Having that background and uh, President Seven himself having been a foreign agent at some point, he well knows uh, that, of course, he has uh, over 40 years now, um, about 40 years of his rule. He has enemies. He has uh, people who want to, 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 to be president as well. Uh, he has uh, people from, uh, you know, other countries who feel that uh, uh, maybe are not well with the way uh, his government does business. So he's aware of this. And when we talk about the foreign agent, uh, it, it, we might have um, a foreign agent who I need, whose target is to, 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 to throw, from his, from his point of view, to throw his uh, uh, regime out of government. My only concern with the, with the foreign agent narrative is politicizing it when it is politicized. That is one. Two, it is when it is used as um, a scapegoat uh, tool. That is my only concern. And, and, and number three is when the alleged foreign, agent, foreign agents are not investigated. There, is, there are no investigations. There is no proof. If you're saying that Jim Spire sent Ongo with all the state apparatus that you have, if you're saying that he's receiving funds from a foreign country to, to paint a bad picture about the government, do you have proof of that? Because you have all the intelligence, you can access every information. Do you have proof of that? That is my point. The, the, the second issue is politicizing. I don't think that Jim Spire or Nova or Solomon, that when I get to learn that, uh, that, th th that uh, some elements at parliament are looting and misusing um, the taxpayers' money, that I need to first ring someone from the US or from Kenya or Rwanda or whether, to say, I have, I've gotten credible information that uh, someone is, is, is misusing taxpayers' money, so you first pay me so that I can expose these people. I don't, I don't think that that makes sense. That really doesn't make sense. So for me, the foreign agent narrative should never be used uh, for, uh, as a political tool, that when you, uh, there's corruption, there's impunity, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's failure in, 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 in building infrastructure in the country, and citizens are pointing out these issues, and you are now uh, bringing in the foreign agent narrative. The foreign agent narrative should only come in when it is true, when it is well investigated and it is true that there is a, a foreign agent who is maybe trying to, to destabilize the security of the country or something like that. Uh, look at this uh, 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 Solomon and, and the other people in the space. Personally, I, I, I don't support homosexuality and I've said it and I've made it clear on, on, on this space. But my concern is that why always bring the homosexuality issue as, as a government official, why do you bring it when you are gotten in a corruption scandal? Why don't we discuss this when there, is, there, there are no scandals? You know, that, that's, that, that, that's the problem that we always have. When the speaker is questioned on why she spends a lot of money, you know, we have all been following. Then you, you want to use the homosexuality card as a scapegoat. Now that is wrong for me, in my view, that is wrong. Let's discuss homosexuality as an independent, you know, let it, let it stand alone if all we right. must discuss it. All right. Then let's also discuss corruption as an independent, thank you so much, uh, Solomon. All right, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, Gideon, Gideon, quick here is a thank you. I want to pass the microphone back to my panelists. I'll start with you, so you've heard it from the audience, you've heard it from the speakers, your concluding remarks, and where do we go from here? Yusuf Karibo. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just have three small comments. The first one is that as you've listened to the comments, yeah, it looks like there's argument that we are all foreign agents. All of us are, um, and there's, there's plenty of evidence. All of us are foreign agents. I'm sure the speakers here pointed to a great deal of evidence to suggest that Mr. Seven is a foreign agent. And as I said, Mr. Seven can also point to a lot of evidence to show that uh, people are foreign agents. I mean, quickly, you know, NGOs and civil society organizations in Uganda are in part or fully funded by foreign organizations. You could have them as foreign agents if you want to. Right? And also the point is that M7 doesn't have to have evidence to label anyone a foreign agent. It doesn't matter. So, someone, I want to ask the question that I normally ask. What is going on here? If all of us agree that we're foreign agents, what's going on here? Why do we never bring the foreigner into the conversation? What is the foreigner doing in this conversation? Because the foreigner is here. All of us are foreign agents, but we, and we would like to deny that we're in foreign agents. But what is the foreigner doing here? That is the big question for me. What is the foreign in this foreign agent? And because the foreigner is here, and what are they doing in turning all of us into agents? You see, we don't ask this question. What are they doing? And so maybe that will form the, the subsequent spaces. Uh, and on that, I want to, you know, to say that the foreigner is here to recruit, right? You know, I, I think Spice and Tongue is fully aware. 
And I think in our approaches that it looks to me more than a recruitment drive to their own. You know, trying to entice, to seduce, to capture the independent elite, the elite that are yet to be institutionalized, right? So they are, they're very seductive in their recruitment drives. They first give you, offer you a cashless plaque and photo ops because they're serious people. Oh, they claim to be serious people. And then a couple of other things follow. Uh, they might offer you um, a fellowship, say, at Harvard or at Oxford, a speaking engagement uh, on the BBC, or some of their outlets, which are very prestigious, you know? But that's the art of seduction. So the foreigner is here. He has recruited Mr. Seveni. He has recruited NGO workers and CSOs. He has recruited people in the opposition. And now there's a new breed of activists who might disrupt the entire thing. He will still operate independently. How do you suggest them? How do you make them part of the system? So I think this was ongoing. Uh, Spire Mike throw a dig at me, like Yusuf, you're speaking from Berlin. Uh, I see myself as one of those being seducted, you know? So it's a, it's a thing that we need to be aware about because the possibilities of being seduced and enticed into, into this game are real. And so I want to go back to the point I made at the beginning is that we tend to downplay the presence of the foreign in this convention, as we all of us deny and accuse each other of being political and manipulative. But let's see the foreign as a real factor. And let's discuss the foreign because the foreign is actually here. And the last point, somebody sent me a private message in Uganda. Uh, earlier I was talking about money. And somebody said, nice to know you. He said, billion zero zero zero. He said, okay. <laughs> this is simple. And, and I said, I, 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 he should have listened. Because uh, maybe I should, I should give the response in Uganda because the comment privately came to me in Uganda. So if you do the math, uh, when the Communications Commission tells us that uh, there are 33 million subscribers, telephone users in Uganda, uh, so 33 million subscribers, which means if that's three million, don't use their phones for free. If you want to call, make a phone call, you have to put air to in your phone. So let's say a million yasa to musta to zikavizi makati to be zay air to yoko million kumi natan, right? So we do a million kumi natan. We do the math. A million kumi natan selling their cheapest product to get every morning. If you want to do say for example a last call, you're gonna pay one thou. So a million kumi natan, kui sa amuru kumi. We don't make a decision. We go later in the world. Kumi kumi yaman. A million kumi natan. It is a billion kumi natan. So, the company over MTN, over the was killed at my child, and I was a million in Musulu Kumi, about a million coming at Tan. But you are the billion coming at Tan, who you come at the billion coming at Tan, no Kusam in the Quasat. On a sentiment, only a million, you know what? Not in the million, but eh, no, what? The grammar is the city was for me, Gwanga. To be with Tabaka News was for a book, Cassandi, a telecommission company, the Tunis. Sisa waka zidia kwa nguo tu ali sente zibu guanga isipo wazi sente zifuma kwa ngi ya ya fetu ya kuwe chibu sabi this is not the conversation somebody sent me this question somebody should respond to Uganda this is the money in the country right so if the daily loss is fifteen billion times three days you have forty forty five billion times thirty days you have four hundred fifty billion and you are looking at the cheapest product that the telecommunication company is dealing in right so what what we fail to do as a country is do the math imagine if forty five four hundred fifty billion was was profit going to a, a telecom owned by the government of Uganda, say, UTL, with us as shareholders, right? This all of this money will stay in the country. I, I guess we'll not be having bad roads, right? So I'm saying, how do you sustain things like this? You sustain this thing through grand corruption, and when you use grand corruption, you're paying, you're paying folks in parliament. So you say, so imagine if, if uh, Airtel has 450 billion Uganda shillings every month from their cheapest product, they can buy whoever they want. I'm not saying they're buying, well, I'm some kind of alluding, uh, suggesting something like that, but they can buy whoever they want. How do they sustain this monopoly? Right, I think this goes back to the, that we need to discuss the foreign, the foreigner in this foreign agent narrative. All right, thank you so much, sir. Thanks thank you. Time. Where is the foreigner in this conversation? Thank you very much. Yusuf Serumkum has left, left us with that discussion. Um, we have the Honorable Nobat Mao, Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs, on the space. Uh, Honorable Mao, I want to give you an opportunity to come and um, share your thoughts. I saw your request, and I thought I would give you an opportunity if I get to Spire. Uh, and I know you've been following the conversation. We'd love to hear from you on this subject. Honorable yes, Mao, you're very welcome. Can you, Solomon? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you, Solomon. Uh, I'm sorry for crushing the conversation. I'll be very brief. I just want to give you <laughs> perspective by answering the question, what is a narrative? Uh, basically, a, a narrative is a tool, and it is a tool for shaping opinions, perceptions, even biases. So let me state that we live in a world where there's a battle for our minds. There's a battle for your mind. There's a battle for my mind. There's a battle for the minds of all the citizens. So narratives are intended to cultivate certain perceptions. So in, since my 20s, I've been a student of propaganda, and uh, I study it intensely. I study how ideas are uprooted from people's minds and new ideas planted. And I specialize sometimes in studying advertising. So just to give some 
context to this debate, let me share with you some, something I saw in Dar es Salaam in the early 2000s. There was a billboard by one telecom company, I believe it was Mobitel, and they had a picture of a huge lion. The tagline was <laughs> Mobitel, the lion in telecommunications. And then 100 meters away from that, there was another big billboard by a rival telecom company, Vodacom. And it had a picture of a Maasai warrior with a massive spear. And the tagline was Vodacom, the lion's nightmare. So I, I hope that gives you an idea of uh, this battle which is going on daily. So when they tag something on you that you are a, a foreign agent, it really doesn't matter whether it is true or not. It doesn't matter whether there's evidence or not. And it means that you're a problem to the country. The same way that American politicians always blame everything on Mexicans. And yet when they go to office, they janitize a Mexican, <coughs> the concierge in the hotels are Mexicans, <coughs> the housekeepers in hotels are Mexicans, but they are shamelessly still driving that narrative. So you have got to ask the agenda of this kind of, of, of narrative. The agenda is to, to cast and disempower those, those who are probably having competing ideas. I just thought I should say that so that uh, we disabuse ourselves of any illusion that this is going to stop. This is not going to stop. It is going to continue and it is going to be even more intense. It has been used by all sorts of, uh, of, uh, of, of people and uh, these kind of narratives are enemies of, uh, of, of, of democracy. And it can be about foreigners, it can be about creating inbuilt prejudice against a community, against a tribe. I don't have time to elaborate my own experience, but perhaps one time I'll have the opportunity. Thank you, Solomon. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Nobat I wish I would give you uh, another two minutes or three minutes to elaborate your experience. But Honorable Mao, do you envision a time when this propaganda and this foreign, you know, foreign agent agenda will, you know, snap into <coughs> our legal and policy framework, just like what we've seen in Georgia and Russia and in other countries where propaganda is very important? I mean, like you've mentioned, if you can convince me that Nobat Mao is a foreign agent, then it will even discredit, in a way, his views uh, and opinions. Even when he's right, there will be that cast spell that, uh, that one. No, but Mao is, is, is just pushing a foreign agenda. Yeah, but do you envision taking this ahead beyond just what the president is saying? Because saying, we're investigating, we know you, we know you, we know you. Eventually, for him to act, he may need a legal instrument or something. Do you, do you think that we'll get there? Well, Solomon, if, if you are challenging somebody's power, they will throw everything at you to preserve it. And let me state that these allegations are not entirely without basis. When in the 1980s, the NRA was fighting the Uganda government, you had the one rocker Sisi who decided to expel all the people in Banyarwanda. And his uh, reason was that they were the backbone of the Luero war. And uh, of course, later it turned out that it was true because that, that is how we ended up with the core of the, the RPF that uh, went and took over government in Rwanda. So. I, I just want us, if we are truly honest intellectuals and not just degenerating into politics, we have got to say that there is some truth into that. You have had in the House of Lords a debate where the Lords are talking about regime change in Uganda and they are talking about how they should support the Ugandan leader of opposition, Joel Senyonyi. So, so definitely, there, there is a basis to, 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 to conclude that definitely there are foreigners who are interested in weaponizing political actors in Uganda. And uh, no matter whether it is for good or for bad, it is a fact. And, and I hope that persuades you that these allegations are not entirely without basis. Now, in a, these kind of narratives, of course, are dangerous in, in a democracy because you, you, you end up polarizing the society and you make consensus building very, very difficult. But it is not just one way. I have said before that, for instance, some members of our Ugandan civil society refer to the government as a junta. Now, when you use that kind of language, then the pushback by the government is to say, you are enemies of the Ugandan state, you are foreign agents, and things like that. So we need to have an open conversation and agree that, you know, ultimately, this is not the way to build our country. Thank you, Solomon. Honorable Norbert Mao, stay with us. Thank you very much for being part of the space. Jimmy, I want to bring you in. Dr. Jimmy Spire, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I also somehow <coughs> interrupt this conversation, and I came in midway. So I could even have repeated what others said. It's interesting coming after um, uh, Honorable Nobat Mao, and I really like his interesting analysis and the honesty need to say that this often happens and it's not about to stop. And somehow he acknowledges that if you're challenging government, government will try to throw everything it can at you. 
Yeah, but also to go back to what um, <clears throat> Yusuf said earlier, um, yeah, I think in a way, yeah, I agree that um, there is so much foreign, um, the, the foreign hand is quite strong around us. And we also maybe need to define what we mean by foreign. <clears throat> but in the presence of the foreign hand, I we might need also to move out of the framework that uh, presents as negative anything that we say to be foreign, because there is a, a selectiveness in which we uh, we imagine the foreign. Like when it serves us, it is okay, and when it doesn't serve us, it's not okay. And I think um, that is often problematic, just like some people who argue that a thing becomes wrong when it is foreign, and then you ask them, okay, you do this, this, and this. Is it um, a native? Is it something that has always been part of our practices? They say no, so why isn't it wrong if foreignness in itself makes a thing wrong? And I think that should also apply to the kind of um, sometimes people will need a support. You know what often happens is that um, maybe I would use the scenario of, um, yeah, first of all, humans generally are pre-wired to survival. The instinct for self-preservation, I think, is one of the first ones that everyone is born with. That's why a child, if it sees an object that is dangerous, at times even if it has never seen it, it will cry because it's trying to preserve itself. You hold it above a pit, it has never seen a pit, but there is a feeling that this could, <clears throat> I could lose my life. So that inclination, natural inclination towards self um preservation and survival will always make people find a means to survive when they're hard pressed so if you're hard pressed uh, for instance within a context of a country you will have to find a way of surviving even if it means using the hand of someone from without now what often happens is that government will press you uh, not all governments but government will press you and once they press you so hard they suffocate you they know of course that you're going to look for somewhere uh, to find a means of survival maybe here i would use the analogy of a stepchild who is denied food at home, but once they are found eating at the neighbors, of course they'll eat at the neighbors in, in order to survive, then that becomes a bigger case than the fact that they are starved. All along human history, where humans have been uh, suffocated, when they have been oppressed, they have tried to find whatever means they can in order to overcome that oppression. When Africans were fighting for independence, we know quite clearly that they worked with different uh, agents or countries that were foreign, that many African countries worked with Russia, which was a foreign agent, um, and some with the U.S. So there has always been an attempt at finding whatever means one can use in order to survive. Now, in the context of Uganda, and actually I would imagine what how it feels like, maybe uh, Honorable Nobat Ma would know this better, for an agent on the opposition, you, you're not going to mobilize here to fundraise, for instance. You're not going to get money to run the so many activities that you have to run as an opposition party. You will need um, to rely on funding from without not even considering the fact that even government itself relies on that. But then they will use that very fact that you're getting funding from without to organize in order to be able to overcome your encumbrances uh, or to change your condition. They use that to say that, look, um, he's, he or she is working with uh, foreign agents. So for me, I just look at it from that angle and not as such to problematize uh, it in the way uh, Yusuf seems to present it that this is a capture, uh, a capture of the elite that is, uh, of course, I know that for the foreigners in quotes, they have their own interest. Everyone has an interest that we cannot rule that out. Even the person that comes to help you quite often, they will have their interest. But what I wouldn't want to happen is to turn the victimhood of the one who is trying to survive into the problem. To say, okay, this one who is trying to survive, why are they trying to get help from the other one who also has an interest? They will certainly have to find uh, that help. And of course, we can discuss. Maybe that's, uh, as uh, Yusuf says, that could be the reason why he knows that uh, being based in Berlin could be part of the problem, but he finds himself going to Berlin in order to survive. So it's sort of a contradiction, but at po at some points it becomes inevitable in the circumstances in which we operate, where you're hard pressed, you're uh, starved by those that are supposed to uh, to aid to facilitate your survival, not necessarily to aid. I would also add that it is part of the human condition that whenever we are confronted with an inconvenient truth, we create propaganda. Whenever you're confronted with um, information that you have no legitimate response to, you have no sensible response to, you have to create propaganda to help you, first of all, to seem sensible. Uh, second, to seem as if you're not stu stupi stupid to be in that particular light. Of late, government has been overwhelmed by these um, uh, stories, uh, scandals, uh, these scandal in parliament, scandal in health, scandal from wherever, the constant supply of scandals that we have. They no longer have any genuine reason or any genuine way to, to explain that would make sense for a person to understand why a government would have such rampant corruption without doing anything uh, about it. So what they are left with is to create propaganda. So when you see that all that a person, a government does in response to genuine concerns is to create propaganda, it means they have run out of explanations that would make sense. But why I say that it is part of the human condition for um, for us to often respond to inconvenient truths by creating propaganda 
you will see it in so many areas, even in everyday life. Uh, there is this, um, 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 the tactic is uh, akin to what the Luganda expression uh, talks about. That if someone wants you to be eaten by a leopard, they will put goat ears on you. Um, you've heard often, or you've uh, witnessed in some instances, that when so someone performs or someone acts in particular ways that cannot be explained, maybe by those who are in competition with them, they'll create something negative to explain it. When, for instance, someone is so beautiful, you will hear a narrative somewhere or a malaya. So when you say that that is a malaya, it means that the beauty is somehow pulled down for everyone else to understand it from a point of view that it is not normal. After all, uh, the possessor, or even if it's normal, but the possessor has something so uh, bad about them, so we shouldn't focus on their beauty. If one sings so well, uh, you hear stories at a certain point, a chameleon was battling with stories that he goes down the lake. <laughs> Why, where do those stories come from? They'll come from the same people within the, uh, within the music industry in order to explain away the, his good music. When someone is so rich on a village, they, have, um, they are using juju. So even in such a case for government to use these kinds of narratives, it just clearly shows that it is a truth they are overwhelmed with and they have no other sensible way of responding apart from simply deflating with um, uh, an ad hominem that will somehow tone it down. And it's not about to stop, as um, Honorable uh, Mao has said, but what we need are masses that can easily read behind this propaganda. The good thing is that the propaganda from the detractors is often not sophisticated. If only we had some basic tools of um, discerning it. But, uh, of course, someone who would want to keep you valuable, gullible, will not give you the education that you need to understand their manipulation. So we are given the kind of education that we have as Ugandans so that we become easy to manipulate. And how does this manipulation happen for people to believe it? Just simply repeat something a number of times. There is um, a tendency in human learning, in human habituation, that when we hear something a number of times, it starts sounding to be true. Again, that is a tactic in propaganda. Just repeat it so many times. If people are so gullible, if people can easily believe, but also overwhelm them, on the other hand, overwhelm them with other information so that they don't take time to reflect about um, about. Uh, Yusuf, can you hear Jimmy? I don't know. Is it my end? All right, thank you. Um, I don't know if it's my end or it's my network or something. Uh, but thank you very much, everyone, uh, for being part of the space. Um, especially thank you to Jimmy Spire, uh, Yusuf Serunkuma, the Honorable Nobat Mao, uh, Nicolas Opio, and everyone who has attended this Twitter space. It has been recorded, um, and the number of people who wanted to talk, unfortunately, I cannot continue the space. I mean, it started at 6. It's now 9.30, literally. Um, so you'll allow me in the space. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Thank you. We're going to turn this conversation into a podcast and we will share it so that you can listen to it. It has also been recorded. You can go back and listen to it. I'm Solomon Serwanda. It's been such an honor hosting over uh, 800 people who actively listen to the space. Thank you very much. Good night and God bless.